Good evening. I'll call the meeting to order for the purpose of electing a chair. Um, at this time, if someone would like to submit a nomination, it would be accepted. Councillor Holland. Thank you. I nominate Councillor. And would there be a seconder? Councillor Hill and Councillor Stroud, should you be elected, would you be okay with that? Okay. Are there any other nominations to come forward for the position of chair at this time? Seeing none, I'll close the nomination process and we'll just vote on the election of Councillor Stroud as chair of the Administrative Policies Committee. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries. Yep. And I'll just accept the nomination at this point for the position of Vice Chair Councillor Hill. And is there a seconder? Uh, Councillor Holland, and would you accept the nomination if you're elected? Sure, okay. Any other nominations to come forward at this time? Seeing none, I'll close nominations and we'll just vote to elect uh, Councillor Chappelle as Vice Chair. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries. Thank you, James. So let me, I uh, just have to get my, uh, I guess, I think I know from memory, it would be, uh, it would be the, the order of the agenda, right? Yes. Yeah. We have a public meeting. Oh, there's a public meeting, okay. So actually, before we even approve the agenda or call to order, there's the public meeting. So it's the mandatory public meeting for the tax write-offs pursuant to sections 357 and 358 of the Municipal Act. And uh, so I need to read the script. There's a script, right? There's no script. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So I believe this is a first for us, so maybe staff could uh, maybe introduce the public meeting portion and then I'll, I'll see if anyone wants to speak. Thank you to you, Mr. Chair. So the, uh, the public meeting portion, the, the report is actually under the next part down on the agenda, um, but the public meeting portion is just in case there's anyone that's here to speak to the actual uh, write-offs that are being presented for approval. Okay, so, the, so there's a mandatory public meeting uh, that we have at the beginning. If you're here to speak, if you're a member of the public and you're here to speak to the uh, proposed changes, this would be your chance during the public meeting. Your comments will be recorded. Please take a microphone. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to staff for the report. And I guess I'm in favor of the proposal as put together by staff. And what I would like to see is more data along the lines of a five-year um, comparison as to how the city has been dealing with this, um, or possibly longer, just as, as a way of picking up the trends um, that we're seeing. So you're um, showing a very high degree of diligent, diligence and uh, professional uh, work, I think, in all areas of the accounting um, as uh, employees of the city. So I'm pleased with that. And I've seen similar um, items come to this committee in the past. I've been following it up. And I'm also wondering how the city of Kingston compares in this respect to other municipalities in Ontario of similar size. If there's been an examination of that done, obviously there's a lot of differences uh, as well. You may have a city that's similar size but with a very different uh, makeup of, say, properties, but in industry and so forth. So it is going to vary. But I think it might be interesting to take a good look at that. So I would respectfully request that um, the right channels be used to generate that information, whether it's councillors asking for it or staff taking it up on their own, and that that be presented um, in a public fashion at some point during this council's term. Thank you. Thank you. So the clerk has taken down those comments as uh, general comments about this procedure. The um, specifics are under business 9A, you'll see, and, I'm, and, I, and when that comes up, 
in the agenda. Staff will introduce the item as they normally do. There's a recommendation there. You'll see that it, um, there's, there's some organizations affected by this particular recommendation and, and this would be their specific time to speak to that recommendation should they want to. Does anyone else wish to speak? Okay, so we'll, I'm officially closing the public meeting section. So that is closed, we need to vote for that. Okay, so that's, uh, that's done. So now we go back to the regular meeting. So we need to call it to order, which I've done. And we need to approve the agenda. There is an addendum. It is correspondence from a Miss Bailey from the Frontenac Heritage Foundation about the Capital Place Illumination Policy Review. It should be on your desks. So I need a mover and a seconder uh, for the agenda. Moved by Councillor Hill, seconded by Councillor Chappelle. So we've got the addendum. Is there any other changes to the published agenda that are proposed? Seeing none, uh, I, uh, we will vote on the approval of the agenda with the addendum. All those in favor? Opposed, and that carries. Now we have the minutes from our last meeting. So this was November 8th, uh, 2018. So last council needs to be moved by someone that was a member of that committee. I believe that's just Councillor Holland. Uh, so moved by Councillor Holland, can be seconded by anyone? Seconded by Councillor McLaren. Now, those meeting minutes are where? Here, let me just, just uh, give me a moment to just quickly see those. Okay, I've reviewed the uh, minutes. I was also present at that meeting, and I see that they're complete. Councillor Holland, are you okay with the minutes? Yeah, okay, so we're gonna vote to accept the minutes from last meeting. All those in favor? Opposed, and that carries. So then we have disclosure of pecuniary interest. Seeing none. Are there any delegations? There are no delegations or briefings. No briefings. So business 9A, so now we're back to the item that the public meeting was for, so that's the tax write-offs pursuant to the Municipal Act, and you'll see the recommendation under 9A, and maybe staff could tell us a little bit more about this. Go ahead, uh, Treasurer Kennedy. Thank you through your Mr. Chitty report. In front of you, the uh, tax write-offs pursuant to the Municipal Act. Um, you see this probably three or four times uh, maximum in a year. Um, and I think maybe I can start just in addressing the resident's question. I, I think if I'm interpreting the question right, um, he was looking more around in comparison to others in terms of the diligence that we're doing in terms of tax collection, which is sort of the other side of the write-offs. Um, and that is reported on the annual audited financial statements every year. And we tend to look at it in comparison to others as we look at the amount uncollected as a percentage of our tax levy. That's kind of the... the uh, key performance indicator that municipalities use. Um, so I don't have those numbers in front of me, but I can tell you that we are uh, one of the lowest in our Eastern Ontario comparators. Um, and in terms of sort of an, an urban area, we're, uh, we're quite low. I think the last time I looked at it was probably around four or 5% um, of outstanding as a percentage of our levy. Um, in terms of the write-offs themselves, in terms of comparisons, it's a little more difficult to compare because this report um, is property specific. So it relates to write-offs. It's not people not paying the taxes. It relates more to things like where there, uh, it's a change in the property class that, that uh, MPAC has made. 
um, or if a building's been destroyed or damaged by fire, then MPAC is reducing the assessment on that. Or if there's been a clerical error on the assessment roll that MPAC has made and then there's, and they're changing that. So it's not something that's as easy to compare across properties. It really just depends on the, uh, the activities of MPAC and what's happening with those specific projects or those uh, properties. Um, so the appendix, uh, the exhibit to this report lists the specific properties that we're requesting in terms of a, uh, a write-off or a tax adjustment. Um, and the total is about $20,000 that we're requesting for approval, of which about $16,000 is municipal and the remaining is uh, uh, school board related. Yes, and you'll see there's a chart of those properties, page five and six in the package. Uh, so thank you very much. So we would now go to questions from members of the committee. Questions only, so it's not on the floor yet. So no, uh, no debate, no comments, just questions. Anyone? Okay, so seeing no questions from members of the committee, we go to members of the public. Now members of the public each get five minutes and it's for questions and or comments. I know we had one member already uh, spoke to this. Is there anyone else? No? Okay. Uh, does staff want to add anything uh, else that, rather, uh, other than what you just said? No. Okay. So we now would move the recommendation. We need to move her in a seconder for the recommendation. Moved by Councillor Hill, seconded by Councillor Holland. So the recommendation that Council approve the cancellation, reduction, or refund of taxes pursuant to applications made under 357 and 358 sections of the Municipal Act, totaling $21,138.22, of which $16,701.31 is the city's portion, and the amount charged back to the school boards and downtown Kingston BIA are $4,283.12, and uh, for the uh, school boards and $153.79, respectively, as listed in Exhibit A attached to report number AP19-002. So that's the recommendation. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Any debate? Seeing none, we will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed, and that carries unanimously. Thank you. That's 9A. We now move to 9B, which is the 2019 tax ratios and tax capping parameters. There's a report, and there's also a recommendation. I'll look to staff to introduce this one. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. So this report uh, has a couple of recommendations, two things that the purpose of this report uh, is before you tonight. First of all, recommending setting the property class tax ratios, um, and then uh, the as well as the parameters for the property tax capping program for 2019. So the property class tax ratios are used to distribute the tax burden across each of the property classes. Um, and then the tax capping program, which is specifically for the commercial, industrial, and multi-residential properties, um, the recommendations you'll see here are for us to use whatever options we have to actually get out of the capping program. Um, and for those councillors that have looked at this in the past, you'll recall that we have, we have been making uh, uh, significant progress in terms of getting out of the capping program, which means getting all of these properties to a... Uh, uh, current value assessment situation. So I'll come back to that in a moment. So in terms of the property class tax ratios, um, there are a couple of policy directions that are currently in play with respect to the, the tax ratios. Uh, first of all, that the any ratios that we have are established not to exceed the provincial levy restriction threshold for any class which basically means we don't have a limitation on being able to pass budget increases to any specific property class. So that's a policy we have in place now um, that we don't want to exceed that threshold so that we don't have that limitation. Uh, the second one that's in play uh, is the farm property class ratio. And you may recall in the past within our four year assessment period uh, that the farm class assessment went up significantly. Um, I believe it was about 80% average overall of their assessment. And so there is a policy right now in play that we would reduce that ratio to try to offset some of that assessment increase um, over the four year assessment period. So it was at 0.25. Residential is always one. Farm class is, is a quarter of that. Um, and over the four years, we're looking at bringing it down to 0.2. 
So for 2019, we're recommending that that would be at 0.2125 for the farm tax. Um, so in terms of a couple of things that we've got with respect to the policies, the multi-residential property tax class, and this is similar to what we did last year. So again, this was another class that saw a significant increase in their average assessment. Uh, their CVA assessment went up about 40%, uh, and we saw that across the province. Um, and just to put that in perspective, that compares to our total assessment went up about 13% across the municipality. So in that regard, uh, I think uh, last year, and you may recall the year prior to that, the province actually had reduced the multi-residential tax ratio down um, to 2% or to 2.0. And uh, last year, we then moved it down to 1.9 to try to offset some of this assessment increase. Uh, it's important to note the implications of this on the rental market affordability because tax increases can be passed on to renters within the multi-residential. So as a result of that, we are recommending that we continue this year to offset that assessment increase um, by bringing the tax ratio down to 1.8. The, uh, the next couple of pages in the report do just give you some information on the, the burden shift and, and the proportions that each tax class are paying of the total property tax that needs to be raised. But I do want to point out um, on page, it's my page eight of the report, it's table four of the report. And this is normally a table that uh, will come back to you when we bring the final tax rates to council. But it just gives you an idea of the average residential tax increase and the effect of these policies. So you'll see on that table the municipal budget increase that was approved by council at budget time of two and a half percent. And then you'll see the various shifts that are happening just for the average residential tax class. Um, and you'll see there is some room there because there was a reassessment tax shift away from residential, primarily to the multi-res and the farm classes. Uh, you'll see the effect of these two tax shifts and the, the policies surrounding those with an average tax increase for just the municipal of 2.3%. So we're actually sitting now at 23 um, and we do anticipate, we did get the education rates in a few days ago, and we're just working through those numbers now. So we do anticipate that that average final tax increase for an average residential property um, will be down below 2% by the time we, we uh, add the education on. Um, so as I said, the, the property tax capping program, uh, the commercial and industrial and multi-residential properties are covered by a mandatory tax capping program that basically limited the tax increases that could be put towards these properties resulting from reassessment. And we continue here to use the options that the province has given us over the years to try to get people out of these, try to get properties out of these uh, capping program as quickly as we can so that all properties are paying at their, their current value assessment. And so the recommendations continue to, to support that for this year for, uh, for 2019. Great. For the benefit of the committee, because there's a couple new members here, just a couple highlights from what you just said, if, if you just confirm. So the uh, municipal, the, we voted at budget time to an increase of 2.5% from, from where we sat. That was affected in two major ways. One was by the different classes and the way that they affect that rate for the average municipal. So you'll see it on table four, 2.5 going to 2.3, and the second major way is with the education portion, which comes at a different time. And you said verbally, it's not in this table, that that would mean that the, this, this is the residential rate, the 2.3? Yes, that's yeah. correct. So the, is the largest class for, for citizens, yeah. So most citizens of Kingston would be affected if they're homeowners, they would be affected by that rate, and with the education included, you said 1.8 something? Yes. We expect it to be coming below the two, so I think probably somewhere around uh, 1.7. Right. And you'll, members of the committee will remember at strategic planning we were saying it'd be nice if we could communicate that better to the members of the public that aren't here at administrative policies, uh, which they're not. Uh, CAO, did you have something to say too? 
Thank you, and uh, yes, absolutely. We have actually already discussed how we wanted to approach this, and we will need to do some uh, communication around the actual final tax rate being lower than 2%, where people obviously have been making the assumption that it's 2.5 based on the municipal portion only. Okay, uh, so now we'll go to uh, members of the committee for questions about the report or the recommendation. Yes, Councillor Chappelle. Slow up for a second, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Through you, um, with regards to commercial property taxes, uh, the, the ratio that we have, I think, is one point, uh, it's not moving for me here, 1.98. What was it last year? And I I'm just would like to see how the trend looks going forward if, if it's been increasing because you know I have spoken to, even though I don't reside in the downtown core I have spoken to some property owners in the downtown core and we have a great robust um, business section but the problem I'm finding is that if they don't actually own the building outright they would never be able to afford to pay rent and pay taxes and move in and open a business that's, that's the general tone that I get. So I'm just wondering how the um, business commercial tax rate has, has changed over the last year, two years, or where you for, forecast it to go in the next year. Go ahead. Through you, Your Honor. The municipal levy restriction threshold for the commercial class is at 1.98, and we have been at that tax ratio for the last number of years. We have not lowered it beyond there. Uh, we can lower it. We cannot increase it uh, and still pass along uh, full uh, budget increases if we were to raise it. And if we do lower it, then we cannot raise it back up again to the 1.98 or above anything that we lower it down to until we get below 1.1 if we were to lower it. And... Um it, just so we could, we just to clarify the councillor's question for the business owners that are feeling a, a financial pinch, could some of that be the property assessment that's causing the high tax bill? Yes, yeah, certainly the property assessment is what is driving the tax bill. That, along with the um, tax ratio that we have set for the commercial class. So they do have the avenue to appeal their assessment if they feel it is incorrect. And um, that would be the, the way that they would be able to get a relief from it if they do feel that their assessment is incorrect. Great question. Seeing none. Um, Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait till uh, deliberations. I'm not going to ask a question. Okay. Members of the public. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the report and the explanation. So I've got three questions. Um, the first one is, I noticed that you have section B, which is the new multi-residential property tax. Then you have Section A, the residential property tax. And then you have a multi-residential property tax as well, right? So those are all different. So what I'm wondering is, how long are the new multi-residential property um, pro uh, properties at the 1.00 rate? And how did they move gradually into the multi-residential property class rate, which is at 1.80? So there's quite a difference there. So is there a, um, a set period and does it move on a linear um, slope upwards to the 1.8? So that's the first question. Second question is, is there anything um, which could be classed as uh, to encourage more new residential property um, being developed in Kingston as a way of increasing the housing supply 
and fitting in with the goal of the mayor's task force on housing, which is just getting started now. And the goal of, that the mayor set with that is to increase the supply of housing as a way of dealing with our very low vacancy rate, which has been a historic problem in Kingston. So is there anything that we could do there and have staff looked at what other communities in Ontario are doing in that respect to potentially increase the supply of housing through, um, I guess, a, a simulation or some sort of tax break or whatever. I know that this apparently occurs in, in other cities. I'm far from an expert on it. I'm following the media. I don't work in the field. Okay, and then the third question, um, the budget for the province of Ontario came down today and um, the staff member was speaking about the educational aspects as a fraction of the tax uh, levy for the city of Kingston. So what I'm wondering is, are those aspects possibly affected by today's Ontario budget? And obviously it's gonna take time to study the budget and to determine that, but is that affected or is it gonna be constant regardless? Um, so, okay, thank you. Thank you. I'll look to other members of the public. I just wanna remind members of the public that uh, you may have thoughts or questions brought up by the report, but if it's not what the report deals with, like the housing crisis, for example, it's not uh, that those questions are not in order, unfortunately, at this, because uh, we have to keep our comments to the to the report itself. So, although housing prices are related to the tax rate, this particular report is about changing the ratios and not about addressing the housing crisis. Anyway, any other members of the public? So we will go to staff to re respond to those uh, questions that were about the contents of the report. Thank you. Thank you through you, Mr. So the first question on the new multi-residential property class. So a property in that class is there for 35 years. Um, and after that 35 year period, they will go into the multi-residential class. That at this point, there is no phasing in of that. So if, if we were hitting 35 years today, they would be going from a ratio of 1 to a ratio of 1.8. Um, some of what's happened with the multi-residential ratios over the last few years, particularly what the province did a couple of years ago, that was taken into account. Um, and the province, I know, is continuing to review this class. So that was certainly one of the factors that was considered um, and if I had to guess, I would, I would not be surprised if we saw the province continue in the future to do um, initiatives that would bring that down so that when we do start to hit that 35-year mark, um, there won't be a big difference. So I know that's certainly something that they, uh, that they are taking into account to try to bring them back together. Um, in terms of the, and, and I recognize that this isn't about supply of housing, but again, I think I can say that also has been a factor in terms of the provincial guidelines the last couple of years around the multi-residential rate to, to bring that down. Um, the final question on the education aspects of the Ontario budget. So the, the province sets the education rates um, that go on to our tax bill. So will it have an effect? I don't know. Um, there is certainly some investment we heard in the budget that's going into education and, and uh, that would, would play into those rates. Um, what I can say is we haven't seen a lot of increase in the education rates the last few years and that's what's providing us with some of the room to bring that tax rate down below the, the, uh, the two and a half percent. Thank you. So now we move to the recommendation. Uh, we need a mover and a seconder to get it on the floor. Moved by Councillor Hall and seconded by Councillor Hill. So the recommendation is um, that the following recommendation be approved and forwarded to Council on May 8, 2019 for consideration. That Council approve the 2019 tax ratios as follows. A, the residential pro property class be set at 1.0. B, the new multi-residential property class be set at 1.0. C, the multi-residential property tax property class be set at 1.8, D, the commercial property class be set at 1.98, E, the industrial property class be set at 2.63, F, the pipeline property class be set at 1.1728, G, the farm property class be set at 0 0.2125, and H, the managed forest forests property class be set at 0 0.25. That's the first clause. 
There's two other clauses that a bylaw be presented for all three readings in order to establish the 2019 tax ratios and that the 2019 property tax capping uh, programs utilize all the options available that will move properties as quickly as possible to their current value assessment, CVA, tax, and that the funding for cap properties be provided from within each respective tax class. There is another clause that a bylaw and report establishing the capping options used Decreased percentage and actual capping results will be presented for council approval after final property tax bills are calculated and processed. That's the recommendation. And did we move it? No. Yeah. yeah, we did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we moved it before I read it. So it's moved, it's on the floor, and now it's set for debate. Uh, does anyone wish to speak? Okay, I, I wish to speak. So, if, Vice Chair, if you could take the chair. I do, and recognize you. Thank you. Just briefly, uh, regarding the, um, the public perception of how taxes work, I know this from going door to door. Uh, there is a general discontent with taxes. That is a given, I think, in any municipality. But it's, I found it impossible to speak with constituents about this on the doorstep because of my father being a mathematician, I understood that it's a little bit more complex than simply what what they're saying, and so, and I don't want to argue with the constituents at the doorstep because I represent them. <laughs> so I found myself in a bind when people brought up taxes. I I I didn't know what to say because basically the entire population of the city does not understand how taxes work. That's basically it in a nutshell. So maybe I could ask the CAO what kinds of things. We might do, I know it's, very, it's early days, but uh, to improve uh, the education portion of how taxes work so that we, the elected representatives that deal with these questions, have more solid footing for, for, for addressing their concerns. That is a very good question. Um, I, I am not sure exactly yet what the education is going to look like, but we need to find a way to make it, to break it down and make it as simple as possible. And I think ultimately um, what is is a, is a key thing is for, for resident to understand that council can only control a portion, meaning what the budget is set at, then there's assessment that comes into play in, in education. And in the past, uh, I think few years at least we've had a tax rate actually lower than 2.5%. And you're right, that, that hasn't translated to the public. And I, I will say that I don't think we've done a good job actually to really communicate that and try to break it down in a, in a simple way. I'm not sure yet what that breaking it down in a simple way looks like, but that's something we're going to have to work through with our communications team. Thank you. So, from my own understanding of, of the arithmetic, that if your house, when you bought it, was worth 200000 and whatever the tax rate was, and then it goes up by, say, 5%, just to use round numbers, you know, any, anybody could figure out very quickly 200000 200, plus 5%, right? And that, but it's not that simple, because the MPAC, the MPAC will reassess your property value, and property values can change quickly. So, especially where I live, the average property value where I live of a, of a home is uh, close to a million dollars. So if you bought even, and, you, and, and someone might have bought it for 200,000, but it's now 30 years later and it's worth a lot more. So their tax bill has, gone, has quintupled just based on their MPAC alone, nothing to do with the city, right? In fact, mathematically, if there was a, a graph of your tax bill over time compared to, and w w you know, one of those bar graphs that has the little different colors for the different portions of what you're paying. Our, poor, our tax increase ch would change the bar by just a sliver. And it's, it's MPAC that's killing these people. And it's, M and it's MPAC that is, uh, not, not killing them, but you know what I mean? It's the, it's the, it's the property market fluctuations that are actually driving the tax bill. And, um, and, the, and then I don't own a home, but if I, had a, if I bought a home for 200,000 and my tax bill quintupled because of the assessment, but, that, but I could actually sell it for what it was assessed by MPAC, 
I will be profiting, profiting if it quintupled in value, I'll be profiting by 800,000 on a $200,000 home. And the tax bill for those 30 years would not have been anywhere close to that because it's a percentage of your, of your, of your, of your impact, right? It's not, it's, it's, it's not ever going to be as big as the capital gains that you make. So maybe the treasurer could explain that part. Uh, uh, is there any way we could express it in a positive way rather than I'm paying more tax, but as a, for every, for every uh, 10% your property, your property assessment goes up, what portion of that do you get to keep or something like that? Is that possible? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So you actually explained it very well. Um, and I think as, as the acting CAO said that the assessment is a big piece of it that we have no control over. That is operated by AMPAC. Um, I think just a couple things to that. So yes, I think there would be a way to do that and we'll, we'll work with communications to figure out if there is a simple way with graphing, graphics and to try to, uh, to, try to uh, put that information out to the public so there's a better understanding of it. Um, we have, so over the past couple years, we've had some conversations about how do you get this information out because it is complex. Um, and if you try to put the, uh, all the information out that sort of scopes out the issue, it gets pretty complicated and difficult to do and keep it simple. Um, so the last couple of years, we've looked at a couple of things that we've done around just uh, particular components of, of education as sort of a foundational piece and, and try to build on that. So to give you an example, I know there is a common misconception out there that my assessment goes up, so my taxes went up, so the city got more money. Um, and that's not the case. It just means if my assessment went up and yours didn't go up, I'm paying a higher portion of that total pot of money than before. Um, and there is actually, we put some things onto our website and I believe we've linked them in the past on the, on the tax insert uh, document. Um, MPAC has a couple of really good videos on that that explains that in terms of how that works and they've got a couple of other ones on there that they, they have uh, recently created. So we have been linking onto those as well. So I think from a communication standpoint, there's, a, there's an education piece and then there's sort of the communication piece in terms of what's actually happening with the numbers. Um, and I think we definitely look at, we'll look at how we can, we can do a better job of that. Thank you. One other thought to consider would be to not, not have a de debate about the percentage increase primarily, but have a debate about to total budget. And with, you know, with the understanding that we can all do math and figure out what the percentage is, uh, talk about the total budget and the increase and the assessment increase and the, because we're, we're sort of simplifying it to the wrong point. We're simplifying it to the tax increase. That's what gets re reported by the media. And then people, that's where the pressure comes. But actually, regardless of what pressure we feel, the, the, the budgetary constraints are very different from what the media and the, uh, the members of the public actually think they are. Uh, the, the, yeah, thanks. If I add to that, I think the other point too, and something that we've tried to do, and you may have noticed in our tax bill inserts, we've changed the last two or three years to try to address some of how we communicate this. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we notice too is, is that if you think about all your monthly bills, and you'll notice on our tax bill insert the last couple of years, we used to do an, an annual average, and then we went to a monthly because we, we wanted to link it to, tax is not a nice word, but you're paying for services. And so we went to a monthly instead of an annual because when I think about what I pay for my internet or my cable or it's a monthly amount that I pay. And so we tried to, to link up, it's not just a tax, you're paying, this is what it costs so that in the winter time, the road is plowed when you come out and try to get to work or, or if you wanted to uh, do something at, in, in terms of recreation, that those services are available. So you, you're paying a fee for service. So we've tried in some of our communication in the past to do that as well. So it, it's not just, I always think of a tax, it's just a tax on top, it's a percentage of something. This is actually buying services no different than buying your, your cable or your internet service. So, so you'll, I expect we'll build, continue to build some of that into the communication as well. That's a very good point. So uh, leave that, uh, my comments there. Um, thank you very much. And, uh, and I'm done. Yeah. I return it.
Okay. Does anyone else want? Remember, this is a change in property tax uh, ratios. That is the 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 um, what's uh, on the agenda. Yes, Councillor McLaren. Thank you. So, as a result of that last discussion, I thought I understood it, and now I'm not so sure. Could I just ask some clarifying thoughts on that? Uh, first of all, is the assessment in any way related to sale price? And if so, how? Yes, for residential properties, it's based on market value, so it is supposed to mirror sale price as of the reassessment date, which for the last reassessment date was January 1st, 2016. So that's the value that is used for the 17, 18, 19, and 20 years, and any increases between that reassessment date and the previous are phased in equally over that four-year period. And so that becomes uh, worrisome because I recently assessed a property of ours, uh, residential, and it's significantly assessed by a private assess a real estate assessor, significantly different than the MPAC assessment we have for it. And it's been almost seven years. Um, how, does, how does the MPAC assess price value and how is it different from a regular commercial real estate appraiser? Before you answer, I'll allow, but I don't want us to get into a long discussion about MPAC here because that's not actually what's on the agenda. Go ahead. So when MPAC is assessing residential property, it is on a mass basis. They look at um, sales within neighborhoods and uh, the type of house that it is and similar houses should be quite close to sales values. Uh, there are a couple pieces that come into it, and one is the actual value of the house, and then one is equity, that it should be also be equitable with other properties in the area that are similar to it. Um, but if the property is over-assessed, a uh, person does have the ability to ask for a request for reconsideration, and in fact, we'll go out and look at that particular house and how it may differ from another house in the area that is similar or uh, compared to the sale of houses in that area and adjust the assessment accordingly. But uh, their model works very well for where there's a lot of sales. It does not perhaps work as well in areas where there's not as many sales for them to analyze or where houses are very different from each other. So thank you. Councillor Chappelle. I'm just wondering through you, Mr. Chair, um, if there was any consideration of reducing the commercial property tax class to perhaps a, a smidgen amount of 1.97 rather than a 1.98, and what type of impact that would have on the city treasury? You don't have to answer that fully today, but I'm just trying to think about that. I think the one thing I can say on that through you, Mr. Um, Whenever we do that in the commercial or the industrial, it's all going to the residential. And so it's putting more pressure onto the residential. So we do look at sort of all the classes, but, um, and we also look at how they've moved in terms of their assessment in comparison to the other property values. Okay. Any other questions? No, no, we're doing it. Sorry. Yes, so any other uh, comments, debate? Okay, I'll call the vote on the recommendation with all four clauses. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries. Next we have 9C, closed meetings, cl uh, key procedural elements. There's also a report it's from the Acting Director of Legal Services and City Solicitor, and uh, it's an information report, so I'll let uh, the Acting Director of Legal Services introduce the information report and then we'll have basically just questions. Go ahead. Thank you, through you. Um, the uh, report is, as you say, for information purposes, it is somewhat lengthy and it is um, framed around questions that were posed by Council last August. So you'll see that the responses are in line with those uh, responses which Councillors may wish to ask questions uh, structured around that as well. 
We do point out on page four of the report that there is some overlap between um, the answers because just the way they were structured. I'd also point out that um, it was difficult to uh, address closed session illustrating examples from our own experience because that would be managed in closed session. But I have sent through to you uh, court cases and rulings where unfortunately other municipalities had to be brought into open session and public forums to explain themselves. So that's why there are uh, citations from other jurisdictions through this and only one really from Kingston from 12 years ago. So I am a bit at your direction if you wish to, to proceed to questions or you wish to have me proceed uh, question by question as a preliminary discussion. Well, it's, it is a relatively dense report, but it's very, I found it very useful. Uh, I think if anyone, uh, any of us here while reading it had any questions, it might be easier to go through, just jump right to the, to the questions, um, if that's okay, uh, because we've got the report. And, and I, as I understand it, there is nothing stopping us from asking further questions at, an, at a later date as well, because of the importance public record. Is that Correct. right? Correct. Correct. Okay. So, Councillor McLaren. Thank you. So um, the motion is recommendations to improve this, uh, but this came as an information report. That's why I didn't come out with a recommendation to Expo. As an information report, I thought the primary role was to explain the questions as uh, deemed fit, being responsive. And in terms of recommending, um, I have to admit, I received the report as directed and I understood it was to be an information report from the outset and if that was incorrect, uh, um, I apologize. Yes, so the original reason we put this here was because of the Amberley Gavel report that um, found some shortcomings and we were hoping that we could improve the process and uh, among these, among the process, part of it was an education aspect that we didn't understand certain things, and you answered that very well. So just to be clear, uh, this is a much better report than anything else I've ever seen a, uh, from a legal perspective in the sense that it gets very clear, useful answers. However, um, what I think is lacking is that uh, we were hoping to improve the current situation, the current processes, so that what happened in the past doesn't happen again in the future. Um, whereas this made it all very clear a mistake that was made, that was judged to be illegal, um, would still continue even if we had this information, it would appear to me. So um, may I suggest that it be returned as a status quo and we discuss it that way? Hang on a sec. So just so that we're clear about the procedural pieces. So in the report, it has the original motion that passed at council, right? Mm -hmm. And what, uh, what the be it resolved clause says it's it's all verbatim in the report, and then there's there's a detailed response. So I guess maybe I could maybe I could just procedurally ask as chair, is this the first piece of uh, of the response to that mo that motion? Is this the only piece and? And are these questions that we're, that we're getting to now uh, and that we might get at council, but only uh, in the section to, that administrative policies comes up at council, is that the only place that councillors could go into more detail about the, um, about the substance of the, rec of the motion that passed at council? That's my question. Uh, through the structure of the report is based on the motion to council and the operative sections are the portions below be it resolved. S were council to first of all seek to speak to a specific matter, that would be a matter one would tend to want to address in closed session itself because it's speaking about a particular matter uh, affecting this council. So it wouldn't be something that I would recommend or as a lawyer probably be able to address in another context, in another forum. Um, as the chair said earlier, this is, there is certainly an opportunity to continue the conversation, but in terms of response to the motion as presented and the resolution itself, this is the complete response. 
Okay, so uh, Councillor McLaren, you will have to stick to questions and it is not intended to, deba you're not debating staff about the outcome of the report, your or outcome of the motion, you're, you're asking questions of clarification of the report that's in front of you and I would suggest if it is your opinion that there is something missing from the report vis-a-vis uh, -vis the original motion, the way to address that would be with another supplementary motion on the same subject, which I believe would be in camera. Uh, or at least discussed in camera, is that right? That would be the new that would allow the open discussion on the particular. That being said, if the question is also, uh, I believe the chair called this a dense report, and it's, you know, it is, has a lot of footnotes. If there was a wish to have it converted into a more publicly digestible format, that would be possible too, if that would assist. Okay, anyways, back to Council McLaren. Uh, you may ask questions, uh, but you may not enter into debate with staff about uh, the context. You can only ask questions. Go ahead. May I ask, uh, since this was originally on to the Amberley Gavel report, it, there seems to be a, um, a difference of opinion between the Amberley Gavel report on the nature of what a, in, what a uh, confirmation bylaw is. According to the, uh, the, the uh, Amberley Gavel report, it says that uh, they do not count for things that are in camera, only for things that are in public. But your report suggests that um, that's okay, that they include things in camera as well. And may I ask, um, how do we deal with that particular th uh, almost judgment from the report? Through the chair, I can't address what that report said. I can confirm that my review of the law is such that confirmatory bylaws capture everything that occurs in a meeting, and in our process, the meeting is one whole meeting that includes a closed session and an open session, but it is one meeting. Okay. So if we were to um, want to clarify that through some sort of policy change, how would, we, how would you recommend we do that? The confirmatory bylaw is a principle within municipal law generally in Ontario. So it, one of the things I point out is that it is effectively a catch-all. One of the aspects of the question that was put to me was how can we make it clearer, more specific? Its very nature is to be a catch-all so that it becomes a challenge to do something, first of all, separate from the rest of the general municipal law of Ontario, but also to deal with a specific instance. The function is to gather all the elements of the event of a council meeting and address all the ones that didn't have a specific standalone bylaw attached to them because the statute requires that council makes decisions and ratifies them through a bylaw. So where you don't have a specific bylaw for each decision along the way, it just generally captures everything else. In our model, that includes the open and closed session because those are sessions, are portions of the overall meeting. And I'm sure the clerk can understand that's uh, consistent with his understanding. That's correct. So may I ask, why do we have the specific ones if a confirmation bylaw would be sufficient? We have the specific ones because the details, in many cases, are the critical thing to capture. It's not just the fact of the decision. So when we have a bylaw in a planning sense, we have a lot of specific data within that bylaw that needs to be understood and approved upon in the very particular. Whereas if it was, for example, somebody as a counselor brings a point of personal privilege and explains it on the floor and a decision is rendered through the group dynamic of the vote, that isn't something that necessary. It's just one example of the many little things that occur in a, bi in a council meeting that you don't necessarily would ever want to capture through mm -hmm. uh, specific bylaws over and over. So it sounds like you would suggest that for substantive issues, we should have a very specific bylaw. And um, part of what this report, the Amberley Gavel report suggests is that we made a very specific um, substantive decision in camera that um, should have been captured by the very specific bylaw that you're suggesting we didn't need. Is that, did I understand that correctly? Again, I can't comment on the specific report or the matter that was managed 
in closed session? Oh, no, it's an open report. The, the Amberly Gavel was public. It says... But the Amberly Gavel report had an occurrence in closed session. So, Councillor McCann, I, I'm struggling as chair to balance your curiosity, which, your individual curiosity with the, the public good and the need for the public to uh, participate in, in this process. Um, at some point, I'm not suggesting this is right now, but at some point, this, you will have reached the point where further questions should be handled offline with a solicitor in a meeting where you could take your time and, and have a really good back and forth. The, the formal committee structure doesn't really permit that with questions. So um, normally it, it, you do have more latitude in a committee setting, but uh, at some point you'll, you're going to have to consider that you need to meet with the solicitor to have a really good in-depth discussion because you're, uh, unless your questions are questions that members of the public want to hear the answer to, there's not a lot of utility of conducting this in this committee meeting. The reason for the questions was I believe the report is incomplete. That'll be it. Okay. So uh, other councillors have an opportunity to ask questions. Councillor Holland. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about there on um, page six. It uh, there's a um, discussion around the potential to waive privilege, which is not very commonly done, as the report states. I'm just curious, though, procedurally, what's required to waive privilege um, in a closed meeting? Is that something where members of it would come forward as a motion to waive privilege, and there would be a vote? Waiving pr so when, as a solicitor, you meet with uh, counsel in closed session, you're meeting with the client, and the client is the collective. So at least what would have to happen is a vote. But a vote would be based, oh, I thought it was a, oh, sorry, the vote. I'm not known for delicacy of voice, sorry. The vote would be of counsel as a whole and it would be taken after I would expect uh, explanation in the specific by the lawyer of the ramifications. Now, as I think I allude to, there are many instances where things in one case are in closed session, but similar, like certain settlements, can be open session. We've certainly in my time done open session discussions of settlements where it's happy news, a good news, a very good resolution. But other matters, as I think there's a Burlington report talks about, some things are so delicate or involve third party interests in such a way that it becomes very difficult to see how you could ever uh, go in open session. Or sometimes the matter ref relates to, for example, information from upper level governments. And we are in, guided through MFIPA that documents and information from upper level governments is never to be disclosed through an FIPA. So that kind of guides us, if that was a question, for example, in closed session, I would be suggesting that the intention was this is not the sort of thing one waves and puts in the public. So the process would be fairly simple, but it would have to be uh, reviewed in the context of every, any time particular. And generally speaking, you're in privilege because it's already that kind of item. I guess, the, though, I just uh, the reason I asked the question was just to see if there is a there is discretion um, that council has that ability to to use the discretion, not to say that it would. The privilege the privilege is always the clients, but the purpose for even going into the setting is based on the initial advice of the lawyer is, this is an appropriate matter that should be managed in this way, and. You know, I've had situations in private and public practice over 25 years that the discussion is the thing that needs to be done in a discreet way so that a lot of issues can be openly canvassed, but the outcome itself is not necessarily something that is a problem. The other thing is we can, and practically speaking, do often waive little bits of the privilege. So if you report out, but you only do that, implicit in that is the idea that the whole discussion under privilege isn't waived. And so there are cases that I didn't report in here behind this report that talk about 
when people challenged and said, you, wa you actually waived this. By letting out this one letter, you waived the whole privilege over the whole matter. And the court is very reticent to do that because the, the, whether it's a municipal council or an individual, the right to have a discreet, secret discussion with your legal counsel is a constitutional privilege, uh, or a constitutional priv principle of the highest order. So if you're in that setting, very unlikely you're going to be wanting to waive it in total. Okay, any other questions? I, I, actually, I have a question. Um, Vice Chair, I, I guess I need to give up the chair. I take the chair. I see you. I'll be able to answer this question because it, I don't know if it's fair to ask you as the solicitor this question, but it appears to me that some of the confusion uh, that council has about around closed meetings stems not from the content of any particular closed meeting or the outcome or the procedure, but rather from the strange relationship that council has with its solicitor. Because in contrast to in the private sector, when I hire a lawyer, it's pretty clear I'm paying the bill. Lawyer is my lawyer. Everybody knows what that means. The lawyer knows what it means. I know what it means. Everybody knows. In this uh, situation with a group uh, that is the client, and not only that, a group that is always making decisions in open session. And furthermore, this particular group that had a, one of their six strategic priorities, overarching priorities for the entire term of council was open government. How this seems to be, so the question is, what, um, what portion of the, of the, mis, of the conf, not, confusion or contention around the different interpretations of without going into the detail, but the, the fact that there were different interpretations of a closed session investigation by various members of the same board, the council, and therefore it's with an individual, for example, that has a lawyer, unless he's got multiple personalities, that would never happen, but it happens with a council because you have a divergent set of views. So it, is there a portion of the confusion that can be traced to the fact that the council itself never fully agrees, although they're forced to find consensus. Your career in a nutshell. So it's important to remember that when we're in closed session, it is under solicitor client privilege. The council as a whole is my client, not individual counselors, and I am the council's solicitor at that point. If those two things aren't present, you can't have the privilege and so the rules, the special rules around uh, confidentiality, are, and it's actually a word higher than confidentiality, um, that wouldn't even come into being, the relationship at that moment. So without suggesting it's like a star chamber of complete secrecy, um, part of my role, whether it's with this client or private clients, is I am a bearer of secrets. I know things of 25 years of, of, of practice that I can't tell people, but also within that context, I have to advise based on my individual understanding and my personal experience and skill level. As a result, it is not, you may be not surprised to learn that lawyers are adversarial. One of the reasons for that is you do actually have divergent interests and different lawyers can come to different conclusions being people of good faith and good, in, good, uh, good intention. That being said, you also as the lawyer have to pay very special attention when you're in that moment of solicitor client privilege to be as honest and fulsome and operating as an open book because it's once you're out of the privileged moment of the solicitor client meeting, the book closes again. And then I have to go off and perform my instructions as best I can. Okay, so a related question, but it's different. Um, do you have any suggestions? Because if I hire a lawyer and, I, and I'm not satisfied with his performance or I, his opinions are different from mine and therefore our conversation is difficult or whatever, or we, have, you know, we go to different churches or something like that, I always have the option of getting a new lawyer that aligns more with my goals and maybe also my personality or, what, or all the reasons I would, I would 
you know, want to change lawyers. Uh, we don't have that option as a council uh, when, when it comes to the city solicitor, uh, except to completely change the city solicitor, uh, which is sort of a, wouldn't be necessarily in the middle of a, of a file, you know, in the middle of a meeting definitely would not happen. Um, so do you have any suggestions to how to better, uh, uh, for the council to feel more in control of the conversation with their solicitor uh, in the current context and as a result of what's in this report? That is a big difficult question. I can assure you from time to time is appropriate, outside counsel is asked to assist, not because of an inability to, um, as a lawyer, answer the question, but sometimes as a lawyer, you do realize you want another point of view. So that is occurring sometimes. When it's very rare that a corporate body like this council, uh, once I represented a condo board 20 years ago, and the condo board individual members were very um, antagonistic with each other for reasonable reasons that their property interests of their own condominium were at odds with others. But when they came together and had a vote, there wasn't actually a conflict between legal counsel and the corporation, the body that ran the corporation that was the condominium as a whole. It's, it's normal as part of the debate within a body like a political body like a municipal council for there to be different points of view. And I think the goal would be of legal services, certainly, but all, any good lawyer is your ideas. Uh, I often think of a time when I actually was a high school teacher for a brief time. And a lot of what I think we're, I was certainly trying to do in this report is take a very challenging set of questions and, uh, and condense it into something that was understandable and not 200 pages long. So that's an example of good lawyering, I would hope, that I'm using my rhetorical skills and using my understanding, but trying to make sure it's understood and receivable by the client. Because a lawyer always has to speak to the standards and abilities of the client. And when I was a young lawyer, I did family law and criminal law. And I was dealing with some people of modest means with some pretty basic life experiences. But at the same time, I had to fully represent them, just as I have to fully represent this body. So I think if the council as a whole ever got the feeling that it was actually moving in that direction, it has the ability to share in the conversation openly and address uh, these thoughts back to the, the solicitor. I said this is an information report. I'm not permitted to make any comments. Uh, so I will just leave it there at those questions and uh, I'm done, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you. Thank you, I'm Rick Chair. Okay, so it's committed for another round of questions. So, Councillor McLaren, if you want to go again. Questions only, though. Remember that there's, the there's a question to you, actually. Um, since you wouldn't let me actually do all the concerns I have and you suggested that I do this online, could I move a motion of deferral so that I can have a private conversation with him, uh, have the, the conditions uh, addressed, and perhaps, if necessary, the report um, adjusted, perhaps tweaked or uh, adjust or Rewritten. Let me uh, confer with the clerk because I've never had a request to defer an information report before. Just in a second. I have to think about this, but I'll tell you what I'm thinking about before I make my ruling. So basically, this committee cannot direct staff. This committee advises council. Council can direct staff. So if the thought was to have another session uh, to defer for the reason of uh, having another session of questions like we had. Uh, what is the reason for the deferral? And that might help. So you didn't allow me to actually do that it was too much time and to burden the public and all that. Um, I believe I can have a discussion with the, the city solicitor and uh, have them resolved and result in the report itself actually changing as a result of that. Partly because I believe it is um, incomplete and uh, some of the stuff has not been addressed. Yeah, so 
So procedurally, if there's something to add to this information report, it would have to be in a supp supplemental report. Is that correct? If there was anything to add, it would, it, you'd have to put another report. Through the chair, the report is responding to questions from council. It would be my understanding that if a supplemental or further information were be shared, that would be based on a supplemental direction from council. So that's what I said at the beginning. Uh, we, we here at the committee can do whatever this committee is, whatever is within our power, but this is an information report. So this will go to council no matter what we do. No? Mr. Chair, can I maybe offer? Okay, I'm getting confused. Yep. Will, the, will the other six councillors receive this report? So because this report is for information only, the way that reports are structured, they're actually not um, brought forward to council from committee. I think what I'd like to suggest is that there is obviously sufficient interest from members of council in this report that we do bring a report to council um, because I think all of councillors probably should be involved. Um, and the other piece that we could do through this report is if there are some additional areas of cl clarification that we can include in the report based on questions that members of council may have, we can try to do that as best as we can in that report that would be submitted to council as a whole. Thank you, thank you for that offer. I think we would still need as a committee to recommend to council that uh, further work be done because council is the one that has to direct that. Um, so the question is, where is the correct place to do that and is the correct uh, to defer? Yes, go ahead. Um, and I, I'm just trying to be helpful. Um, I think we can we can take it upon ourselves to bring a report to council. We do uh, most of the time bring reports on our own without being directed. So um, I appreciate that this report was provided to the committee. Uh, I think the committee can receive it, but I think what uh, we can do is bring a report to council that would include disinformation, but could also provide additional information where clarification may be um, requested. Yeah, so I'm going to repeat what I said much earlier, that if the councillor feels that this information report is insufficient to deal with the reason that the original motion came to council, then the councillor needs to write another motion on the same subject and have council debate that to, to achieve the end of having further, a further result. And if it, even if it, if it, if it, even if it includes things that your interpretation of what was in the original motion, the because this is the response to the motion. So and it, there, it's it's not debatable. It's an information report. It's not debatable. So if you do not agree that council direction has been followed, that that's also an offline discussion, and we have the off, the offer of having another report with more information. But at the end of the day, it's whether council accepts the, council may or may not rule in the majority in agreement with your contention that there's more uh, that needs to be done, right? Now, now the city clerk would like to say something. Go ahead. To you, Mr. Chair, another option might be as simple as referring the matter to council with direction and then that, become, uh, that a further report go back to council. That might be another option that would hopefully clean up this discussion. And that would be that's an appropriate procedural thing. So if you want to add to this, you can make a motion to, um, would it be to amend the, no. So is that a deferral? Okay, so Council McCann, do you would you like to move that this be referred to Council with an additional report from the CAO? 
The original intent of this was to have some recommendations that would improve pro. So if the additional report includes recommendations, that's essentially what I'm looking for. So if I may recall by reading the resolve clause, that council will address the report by directing staff to return to administrative policies in the first quarter of 2019 with new recommendations, which when I wrote that, it was because I did not want an information report. I figured that the information would be part of the new recommendations and guidelines to meet or improve on the recommendations of the Ombudsman Sunshine Law. Meet or improve was meant to suggest that we may not be where we want to be in terms of openness and transparency because we are short of what the Ombudsman has said and suggested, and that's why we were found guilty. Okay, so I'll repeat myself. I wish to move a motion that this report be referred to council so that it can be debated at council because at the moment it, it stays here. So that debated at council? That would be great. Uh, so in other words, it wouldn't be an information report at that point. Well, so that could be, it would, it, I guess, debated as discussed. So it could be a discussion. And it's not going to appear on the council agenda. Yeah, because that's what it is. Yeah, yeah so right now, Procedurally, this report stays with the committee. Any councillor can read it, but it stays with the committee. If we want it to go to council as an agenda item, you need to make a motion that it go to council. But it, but it won't, it will be this report. We've got the offer from the CAO for additional information. That would be a separate report also to council, that, but you don't need to include that in. I would add both in there. So let's okay. take it to council. Um, with a new report in the hopes that we can have a discussion and a debate on it as opposed to just questions. Okay, Okay. so the councillor wants to write a motion, so we'll take a brief recess, we'll get that in writing, you can work with the clerk, and then we'll bring it back for debate. Uh, five minutes. So the councillor is finished writing the motion and he's sending it to the clerk and then the clerk will read it out. The clerk's actually gonna put it up on the screen for us. So this is uh, moved by Councillor McLaren. No, so we need a seconder. I'll second it. Uh, so it's moved and seconded. And if the, you see it up on the screen, so it's on the floor for debate. Maybe the councillor could just, if, if it's not immediately what you're doing here with this motion. Okay, so part of the reason we moved this motion in the very beginning, uh, last council, was because of an act, uh, because of a clause in the municipal act that says we have to address the issues in the report that came and found us illegally having a closed meeting. The information report was very helpful as far as information was going, but part of what I had intended that it be understood was with the terms new recommendations was that we were going to improve the processes that we have now. And we were looking for staff to look at ways that we can make things better so that the mistakes of the past won't happen again and can't happen again uh, going forward. To that end, that's why I felt that this report is not quite complete. So just to be clear, the research is awesome. This is like light years ahead of anything that I've ever received from a city solicitor in the past. So <laughs> very helpful. However, it's missing that one aspect and I think it was misinterpreted that, that whereas therefore it be resolved clause was misinterpreted. So to add greater clarity, the information here is outstanding and, I, and I, it needs to be part of the record. Uh, so I don't need you to um, adjust it in that sense, but we're looking for um, recommendations to improve the transparency of closed meetings. So um, the, it talk, like you mentioned briefly that uh, it's gonna be expensive if we do all of these various different things, but which ones can we do on a 
and uh, at maybe in a phased in way to get uh, closed meeting minutes, not minutes, um, recordings uh, out. Uh, getting, we need a policy, I would submit, that um, reveals what happened in closed sessions at an appropriate time. All other forms of government do this. So uh, they have archives, that's why that it's, it's a historical record. Um, that seems to be bringing it into 21st century. And whatever that is, that's what we should have been, what I was hoping to debate today. And part of the reason that I wanted those recommendations is because it would go to council automatically after we debated it here. And um, to further address the findings of the Amberly Gavel report. So this report by Amberly Gavel found several things that we, they felt we were doing. Hang on, Councillor, you, you've not discussed the findings of a closed meeting report. It's not was... a closed meeting report. This is an open public report. Oh, okay. Go, go ahead. Um, which, but in, in, again, um, in preparation for this, um, there's lots of things that I starred that uh, I felt were not addressed in this report. Um, and so these extra recommendations are to give further clarification to the original intent of the motion as I wrote it uh, with Councillor Hutchison, who is not here. And uh, the purpose is to improve the processes going forward because um, we were found lacking. We were found guilty of uh, having an illegal council meeting and we shouldn't really be doing that. And that's why this is here. Okay, thank you. So we have a new motion moved and seconded. Uh, one councillor has spoken. There's three of us left on the committee. Uh, and would anyone else wish to speak? And it's back up on the screen. It's fairly straightforward. I mean, I... Yeah, I, I guess I would just go to the CAO because the CAO did... The, fir the first clause to me... Wait, I'm the chair. I need to give up the chair. <laughs> yes. I have the chair and recognize you. Thank you. So now I'm just a committee member. And my, my take on this is that the first clause is a procedural piece to get this report to council, which we already discussed. That's fairly straightforward. I'm also in favor of that first clause. The second clause um, is the new piece, and it's basically from what, he, uh, from what the council just said, I, I understand this to be his perception of what is not addressed by this report specifically, but which was perhaps included in the intention of the original motion. And I know my two colleagues here were not on council at the time of the original motion, so this is all news to you. I would say um, I'd like to hear from my colleagues about what they think of the second clause, and, uh, and I might, uh, if there seems to be some discord on the second clause, I might uh, move separation. That's what I would say of the two clauses. So I'll leave it at that. And uh, I'm in favor of the first clause. And I'm uh, waiting to hear the thoughts of my colleagues for the second clause. I will return the chair to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I recognize Councillor Hill. Well, I'm not really uh, we're doing this because we did have an offer from uh, the acting CAO to do basically what's what's up there. So uh, I think we should be approving this as uh, an information item or receiving it as an information item. Uh, take the, C, the acting CAO's offer to prepare a report that addresses these issues and let's move on. Thank you. Councillor Chappelle to speak. Thank you, Chair. In addition to what uh, Council, um, Deputy Mayor Hill has uh, remarked, I'm really not sure. That, I, I understand the the the, the, pr the intent, but I'm not sure if this is the right avenue for for this for this motion. I, I really believe that this is a, a report of information, and um, I think once the whole of Council, some of them who are on Council prior to my term have a better reflection of what that report has. I think it would have a greater merit at that time to request of staff to hone in on specific aspects of, of the questions that are left unanswered that I really don't have an appreciation for other than what I read in the report. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure this is the right way to go at this point either. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does the mover want to separate the two clauses or does anyone else want to vote on them separately? If, if no one else does, I, I will ask 
to, I'll give up the chair and I'll do that myself. Okay, the okay. Rez asked to separate the clauses, so we're, it's two, two, uh, two votes. So I'll call the vote on the first clause, which is, again, you know, you just put it up on the screen so we can see it. Point of Sorry, there was a uh, small grammatical mistake. We got four with, but it should be just with. And amen, no problem. That was a gram grammar correction. So the first clause, and we're voting on the first clause that AP-19-077 be referred to council. All those in favor? All those opposed? And that fails on a tie. Second clause, that staff prepare a new report of recommendations, A, to improve the transparency of closed meetings, B, to help avoid unnecessary closed meetings, C, to further address the findings of the Amberley Gavel report. All those in favor? All those opposed? And that fails on a tie. That's it for that, I guess. Uh, we will move on to the next uh, piece of business. So now we have first capital place illumination policy review. This is a report, but there's also a recommendation in this case. And uh, before we get to the recommendation, we'll hear, sir, yeah. It, there's no vote on an information report. So yeah, okay. We, before we move on, just to clarify, because it was a little confusing. So the vote, uh, both failed for the, for the new motion. What happens then is essentially, uh, as printed in the package, it, it is an information report. We don't have to vote to receive an information report. Uh, any member of the public or any member of council can access the information report through administrative policies. But we are, it will not appear on the next council agenda because that vote failed. Is that correct, Mr. Clerk? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as the last motion in accordance with our procedural bylaw, it will appear in the council agenda as a last vote. So, Councillor McCarran, you're here on the council agenda, and it will say that it failed on a tie. Okay, so, uh, but the report itself would, no? Okay, uh, actually, it would not say the outcome, it would just be reported to council, neutrally, without a recommendation. And, and then, to the other piece, maybe we could hear from the CAO, but I believe she's probably going to say that she could, she could at any time, being the CAO, bring a report to council, uh, regardless of the outcome of what happened here. Go ahead, the CAO. Mr. Chair, and yes, that's correct. Okay, continued. We're moving on. 9D, first capital plan, illumination policy review, as a member of staff that can introduce this. Mr. Wigginton. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the purpose of this report is to uh, come back to the Administrative Policies Committee regarding the illumination policy. This was first created in 2017 uh, in connection with the installation of a new lighting system for City Hall, and uh, under the requirements of that original policy, we were requested to do a review after the first year of its operation. So. Uh, we've come back with information related to the assessment of that uh, new program and policy uh, with some documentation around the use of the system and also based on feedback that we had requested uh, from various stakeholders. We've also made a couple of recommended changes to uh, the policy for your consideration and potential uh, approval. So a couple of the things that were highlighted through that uh, review process was the need for uh, more specific data related to three of the uh, pre-approved illuminations that had been incorporated as part of the uh, illumination policy. We were also requested to add in Earth Hour in late March as a new uh, date to recognize. And there's also three changes to the body of the policy itself uh, that are somewhat process related. One has to do with the uh, time frame for requests that come forward. Uh, originally, it was established to be at 60 calendar days ahead of a, a request. Uh, that's been adjusted to allow a little bit more uh, short-term flexibility with 45 calendar days, but no longer than 90 calendar days. Uh, there's also language that's been added in that gives us the latitude to 
actually suspend an illumination if it's in conflict with another event that's happening in Market Square, for example, like Movies in the Square. And the final change is also related to uh, requesting Council's consideration that the final approval regarding future uh, amendments to this policy actually be de um, delegated to the corporate management team uh, internally rather than Council itself. And I'm also happy to answer questions, and if you uh, wish, I can also address the correspondence that was added to the agenda uh, tonight as well. I have a simple question, just be, uh, based on what you just said. The Earth Hour that was added, what, I didn't notice that one. What was the color or the, the, uh, the look of that particular illumination sequence? Through you, Mr. Chair, it's actually to turn the lights off uh, in recognition of the fact of wanting to encourage energy savings. So if the building is standardly illuminated that evening, the system actually gets shut down for that hour. Thank you, that would explain why I didn't notice. <laughs> um, okay, any other questions about the report? Uh, and don't forget there's a recommendation as well. Yeah, Councillor Chappell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just with regards, I did follow up with the uh, resident who uh, put forward the correspondence, and uh, I was in congruent with her perspective that that uh, Victoria Day weekend should be lit up as well. And um, if that is possibly a day that we can be adding to uh, the list of dates, I think it would be appropriate since so many people come to the downtown core on, on the May long weekend. It's really the kickoff of our tourism season. It might be nice to have um, City Hall lit up on that time as well. Mr. Wigginton. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, it's certainly Council's prerogative to amend that list as it sees fit. So there is a recommendation here, and if, there, if the detail of the, um, of the amendments recommended by staff don't align exactly with Council's uh, thoughts or our Councillors, then you would move an amendment at the time it, it's moved on to the floor. Not right now, because we're in, we're in questions, but when it comes up. And uh, yeah, the clerk or I can help you with that. Um, any other questions? Yeah, we now go to members of the public about the elimination policy. Seeing none, we need a mover and seconder for the recommendation. The recommendation is that the Administrative Policies Committee recommend that Council approve the amended first capital place illumination policy as proposed in Exhibit A attached to report number AP19-001. Moved by Councilor Hill, or Deputy Mayor Hill, sorry. Seconded by Councilor Spell. Uh, does anyone wish to speak? So uh, maybe, uh, maybe b uh, before we go to, uh, to a possible amendment, maybe I'll just ask as chair because I was also chair of the Heritage Committee and I seem to remember Victoria Day coming up. Um, staff must have looked at all the holidays. What was staff's rationale for this particular alignment? Uh, was it to do with the fact that there was other, other things near Victoria Day uh, weekend or what, what did staff tell us? I'm feeling I've heard this answer before but I can't remember. Through you, Mr. Chair, there was uh, quite a bit of, of research and also public consultation that took place in putting that list together. The original source document for coming up with a, a sort of draft list was a federal document that has to do with National Days of Observance and uh, looking at uh, what uh, is recognized at that level. And through that, we po posed a number of questions to the public through both an online survey and at a public meeting, and then came back with a list uh, that not only tried to uh, make sure that the commemorations were spread out, spread out across the year, uh, but they were also representative of some of the issues that have been raised in the commemoration strategy about a balanced and equitable recognition of different groups across the year, and uh, also by leaving space available for the public to come forward with their own requests. So uh, it was a summation of that kind of input to try and come up with the best high-level list possible, but subsequent to that work, 
Uh, when the policy first came forward, council requested that St. Patrick's Day be added, and obviously now Earth Day has been added as well. So uh, if another event like Victoria Day were, be, were to be added, that's certainly possible, but it starts to build the list of, of things that council's already pre-approved in the calendar year. Just point of information. Yeah, that was just a question, so if you want to speak, go ahead. Yeah. I have a question with regards. Are we able at this committee level to to recommend adding Victoria Day weekend? Because that, And then that would go to council with Victoria Day weekend rather than larger presentation yeah. at city council that, uh, well, why don't we have Victoria Day weekend when it's so close to the May long weekend? Yeah, I, I believe this committee can recommend what it likes to council, but uh, the clerk can tell you how we do that. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the committee could adjust Exhibit A to this report, uh, which will be provided to Council, so any uh, proposed amendments would be dealt with that way. There's a specific wording that you would say that Exhibit A be further amended to, right? So do you, would, do you wish to move such an amendment? Yes, I would move such an amendment to include Saint, um, Victoria Day. Okay, uh, so maybe you can come over and work with the clerk. I'll take a... Reset, do you have it already? Okay, it sounds like he's got it already. He's getting it going here, and it, when it's ready, if you could just put it up on the screen then. So I, the, the amendment would read that, that the recommendation be amended to include Victoria Day as one of the uh, days commemorated and that Exhibit A be further amended to include Victoria Day. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Hill. Any debate? Mr. Vice Chair, can you, or, uh, can you take the chair so I can ask a question? I take the recognize you. To the culture. Um, so the commemorative strategy itself uh, talked about um, a historical uh, preponderance of certain types of commemorations, of which, of course, uh, holidays are one, monuments, uh, parades. There's lots of different ways to commemorate things. But uh, I remember the commemorative, one of the key points that I took away from the commemorative strategy was an, an attempt to have something more in line with the current values of our city. So if maybe the cultural director could expand a little bit on that concept to, to explain why a traditional holiday such as Victoria Day didn't quite make the cut and maybe how close was it and, and was it on the list at, at any time uh, before not being on the final list. In response to your question, Mr. Chair, um, Victoria Day actually was on the list uh, when the survey itself initially went out for public consultation. Uh, it did receive support for being included, uh, but then through a process of consultation and reviewing the possibilities. Um, so the, the federal document that I referred to, the National Days of Observances, has 70 different days in it. So there's quite a robust list of, of uh, days that are potential to be recognized. So there was a number of conversations about, to your point, the fact that there's some things that are very well represented within the Kingston context in terms of commemorations and recognitions and trying to create that balance. So it wasn't necessarily about excluding Victoria Day specifically as much as trying to create a more representative cross-section because the commemoration strategy uh, doesn't necessarily refer to the preponderance of, of certain commemorations, but says that there's things that are well represented and some things that are underrepresented that, that should be uh, given greater attention are issues related to indigenous communities, ethnocultural communities, uh, women and uh, French-speaking communities. So it was trying to uh, assert the need to bring greater attention to some of those other things. Yes. So, um, so follow-up. Is Victoria Day observed in all the provinces in Canada, do you know, or are there some provinces where it's not observed? 
I'm not sure I can speak to that uh, yeah. definitively, but my sense is that it is fairly broadly recognized. Okay. Uh, so I guess my comment would be that Victoria Day is one of those holidays that in Kingston is quite, uh, quite important to the population. So uh, I, w I am in favor of the amendment. Thank you. I would wish to speak. Seeing none, will it's been moved and seconded. Yeah, it's been moved and seconded. It's of, obviously. So we will vote on the amendment to include Victoria Day in the policy. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries. So now we have the amended recommendation, and it would read that the Administrative Policies Committee recommend that Council approve the amended first capital place illumination policy as proposed in Exhibit A as amended to include Victoria Day attached to report number AP-19001. We need a mover and a seconder. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we couldn't have amended it if it wasn't moved. Sorry, I'm losing it. <laughs> It is on the floor. Does anyone want to speak to the amended recommendation? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed, that carries. That's D, now we go to E. And there's also an F. Yeah, so there's two more items. There's E and F. So E is mandatory policy on council staff relations. Uh, this is also a report, also with the recommendation. If staff could introduce it, please. Thank you, Mr. Scrooge, to the members of the committee. Um, the policy before uh, the committee tonight is actually part of the requirement introduced through Bill 68 to the Municipal Act, whereby all municipalities in Ontario must pass a policy regarding st council staff relations. Um, in effect, this is a consolidated restatement of existing policies the city has. The city has a number of policies that deal with the relationship between uh, council and staff and staff and staff and staff among staff, things like the code of conduct, respecting the workplace legislation, things of that nature. What it really poses to do is an articulation of, of basically the mutual workings or partnership of staff and council in the good governance of the community. Uh, and by doing that, it's a clearly identifying r roles and the respect that needs to be shown between those roles, between the staff roles and the council's roles. It's in no way designed to restrict um, challenge of position of staff or to restrict council's ability to govern as they were elected to do, but how that process is to, to unfold in a respectful professional manner so that the community is getting the best balance of the decision making going forward by the information provided, that staff's responsible for bringing the best information forward to them, and also being very responsive to the questions put to, to them by council. That's not to say we're gonna agree on everything, but it's from our perspective, we will provide the information that we believe is the best of our professional ability to allow you to make the decisions you make and also the, the respect that's required in both directions from staff to, to uh, council and council to staff. Great, thank you. So um, we go to questions only from members of the committee. Yeah, members of the public, seeing none. Um, we need a mover and a s seconder to get the recommendation on the floor. So moved by Councillor Chappelle, seconded by Deputy Mayor Hill, who would like to go first. Mr. Chair, I wonder if in the kind of late hour here and the fact that this looks like it's going to be a fairly fulsome discussion, uh, given the comments uh, that, that were uh, relayed to us earlier by Councillor McLaren, I wonder if this is something we could consider deferring to our next uh, admin council meeting. So there's been a motion to defer. I, uh, it needs a second. Next, next minute, I'll say a second. Uh, seconded by Councillor Chappelle. So we can debate this. Uh, be careful, the rules are strict on deferrals. You can debate place, which would be here. It's not really debatable, but it's, it's debatable by procedure. But unless you want to go to a different room, that's not really part of the debate. The debate typically is about time. So um, 
And you can also, when you defer, you can give a reason. Uh, so the defer could just simply be to the next administrative policy meeting. Is that what you said? Yeah. So, so that doesn't really need any extra explanation because it's, it's, it's really uh, to give us the opportunity to have a full discussion. Uh, you could put that in the deferral, but you don't have to. Um, so debate on time. So we'll start with uh, Council, uh, De Deputy Mayor Hill. When do you see this coming back? I would see it coming back to the next uh, policies committee. Uh, maybe Kirk could tell us. The next meeting, thirteenth, June thirteenth. Is that okay? Yep. Okay. Any other comments on time? Okay. I'll call the vote on the deferral. All those in favor? Opposed, and that carries unanimously. The motion is deferred. It'll come back on the June thirteenth agenda. Yeah, so for the two new members, this last item is a little bit special in the sense that this, this committee turns into the board of management for our nursing home, for the Rideau Crest home. So uh, uh, we first need a motion to resolve, it, uh, to resolve ourselves into the board of management for Rideau Crest home. We do that at every meeting. It's just a procedural matter. Who would like to move this? Okay. Councilor McLaren, second. Councillor Spell, so so moved and seconded. Vote, vote on, call the vote. All those in favor? And that carries. We are now the board of management. So as the board of management, I guess I continue as chair. And there's a report from the commissioner of community services. Um, Is that the, sorry, Mr. Kirk, is that the always, uh, it's been a while since I've chaired this committee. Is that the way it always looks? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the report and uh, re associated recommendation is a standard recommendation that's provided. Uh, normally staff provide a one or two month uh, update on the affairs of the home. Right, so this is like the bi-monthly update from the home. And the administrator is here, so maybe I'll give her the floor and she can tell us the highlights of the report. Go ahead. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. So this report does contain information from October 2018 through to the end of February 2019. So it is a fairly lengthy report only because we did cancel our um, meeting in January. So it's normally a, a bi-monthly meeting, yes. So Rita Crest Home maintained um, an overall occupancy rate of 99% for 2018. To date, from January 2019 to the end of March, we have maintained an occupancy rate of 98.83%. Rideau Crest Home um, has had 13 incidents um, and two complaints reportable, reportable to the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care from October through to February. During this time frame, the Ministry of Health was in the home in January to investigate five critical incidents and 14 inquiries. As a result of that uh, investigation, there was one written notification released related to wound care, which the home was in compliance upon completion of the investigation. As of February 2019, there were 406 people on the waiting list for the home. As you can see, there was a number of respiratory outbreaks over this time period and over the winter months. Uh, we were quite happy to have no confirmed cases of influenza A or B over that time frame. The home continues to have a number of quality initiatives. Um, our biggest one is right now looking at the replacement of flooring for our home, uh, which we're hoping to have started by the end of this month. Financials, um, for 2018, Reader Crest was 97.6% spent for that fiscal year, which is 136, almost $137,000 under budget. Most of that was primarily due to wages. For 2019, budget for Rita Crest Home, uh, municipal contribution is just under $6 million. As of the end of February, Rita Crest was 15.28% spent, which is $80,000 underspent, excluding commitments. And I'm open to questions if you have any. Questions for members of the board? I have a question. So you just said, so is that the yearly, the $82,000 underspent? Is your year end? No, it's the end of March, is it not? Yeah. 
And is it per year or by fiscal yes, year? Yes, that's starting January. So just the beginning of okay, this year. Okay, so, so we're under budget at the moment. Yes. Yeah. Are there any deferred, large deferred items that would actually render that a sort of a false, uh, a false uh, surplus? So because it's only a couple of months, there are a number of invoices that aren't inside of that two-month time frame that are still pending. So uh, essentially, it's, it's more or less status quo. Yes. OK. I'm just looking for the other one. Um, two complaints. Yeah. Wound care. Yeah, so, so about the wound care. So this came up, this has come up before. Uh, I'm a nurse, so I know this is a, a fairly common uh, occurrence in a nursing home because you've got bed uh, ridden patients who uh, get pressure ulcers from lying on the same spot uh, for forever, uh, and also other issues such as uh, um, incontinence care and stuff like that that can make uh, wounds, you know, like on, on the backside and, and so on. I've, I see this all the time myself at KGH, so is, is this typical sort of uh, occurrence, and is it typical that a complaint might be launched? Like, how common is this? Through you, Mr. Chair. The... Complaint that, um, or the finding that was found during this investigation, the uh, Ministry of Health was in looking at a certain critical incident. During the course of that investigation of that critical incident, it was found that a weekly wound assessment, so any wound that is had by a patient, is um, a weekly assessment is done by our registered staff. There was a week where that was missed, and so because that um, investigator found that, they are obliged to give us notification of that. So that is what that finding is for. What's the consequence of that fine, or what happens after this, like no. with the notification? No. Yeah. So it's just a written notification to let us know that she has found this as an inspector. When she left the home, we were in compliance. That individual and other um, patients that she did look at their care plan, weekly wound assessments were occurring on a weekly basis. So she was happy with that, that the home was in compliance for that. Okay. Follow up to that. Is, is there any issues with the staffing levels that would have contributed to the fact that there was uh, no uh, registered staff uh, performing that assessment that week? During that investigation, there was no issues with staffing levels. Um, I think there was an issue with communication, is what we had found in terms of the doctor's order getting put on that um, TAR as a treatment record. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Councilor? I, I did not realize that we were the board of management of, of, the, uh, of, of the residents. And uh, perhaps at some point when it's convenient for staff, I wouldn't mind uh, participating in a tour of the facility. Generous, and I'm sure staff can arrange that. They're nodding. Yeah, I know. I know exactly where it is because I used to live across the street. <laughs> um, any other questions, members of the public? Okay, so we need to vote on the recommendation. So we need. Yeah, we need to move. Don't we have to? There's no recommendation. Oh, so there's no recommendation. There's just the the procedural motion to rise from the board. So we need a, again, a mover and a seconder. So Councillor Hill, Councillor Chappelle, all those in favor? Move, that passes. So we're back to being the Administrative Policies Committee. There are no new motions. So, um, is there any other business? Yes, Councillor McLaren. Uh, just a question to staff. Um, the report that we just deferred, is it condemned to come back in the current form or is there any benefit to meeting and perhaps adjusting it in the interim? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, to, to Councillor McLaren. Um, based on our earlier discussion with Councillor McLaren, we're going to make the one adjustment to identify the informal uh, complaint policy, uh, complaint receipt on it. Um, but barring any information from uh, members of the committee, it will, it will go forward as written with the, with the exception of the modification of the uh, complaint policy. So that was just one of uh, several issues. Is it beneficial to meet again and see if there's anything else that could be uh, improved? I'm more than willing to meet with you, Councillor, to discuss any concerns you have on the policy prior to it coming back. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, so just to clarify to the committee then, Mr. Dyke, are you saying basically, theoretically, any anything is possible before it comes back to us. It, it's, it's not 
because it hasn't been and it hasn't been dealt with by the committee, it could come back in a slightly different form. It, it, through that we would recommend being made to inclusion of the piece, identifying an informal complaint resolution policy. The rest of it, we're we're, we're quite comfortable with the policies written. Are you always open for any councillor that wants to discuss the the policy in the interim? That's correct. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that's other business. Any other other business? Nope. Okay. Correspondence. There was a piece of correspondence in the adids from uh, FHF, and um, that's it. So it's just the next meeting, which is June 13th. So I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Councillor McLaren, Councillor Hill, all those in favor? Thank you very much for your patience.